Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit, and this is why we cannot have nice things. One of the reasons we can't have nice things is that the last episode of this show was over a year and a half ago. It was never meant to be a regular show, it was the kind of thing that I like to put together when I had a sudden inspiration or was really getting back into an old game that I felt was not particularly successful for whatever reason. But I think with the release of the new Dungeon Keeper, there's certainly a cause for this video. I've told the story about the original Dungeon Keeper several times, in fact, and I even have the evidence to prove it sitting on my shelf, a Canadian copy of the original Dungeon Keeper with the original sticker that says, For Sale in Canada Only, age 17 plus. It was a game that I picked up when my orchestra, I wouldn't even call it an orchestra, a military band that I was a part of when I was about 12 or 13. Military style band, I wasn't in the actual military at 12, that would be a tad silly. Britain is a dark and grim place, but it's not quite that dark and grim. We went to Canada on tour. We played at several concert dates. It was a really good time. It was my first time out of the country, as it turned out. And I was able to have one free day while I was there, and we went to the Canadian Mall, because honestly, we'd really never seen anything like that. So we did a little bit of shopping here and there, and I went into an electronics boutique. And I got one of my older friends to purchase me a copy of Dungeon Keeper, because I saw this thing in a PC gamer magazine back then, and I was absolutely blown away by the notion it's good to be bad. There weren't all that many games that allowed you to play the bad guy back then, and it was also by a company that I was reasonably familiar with. I recognized that Bullfrog logo because I'd seen it on a game called Populous, of course by Peter Molyneux, the classic god game that I played a reasonable port of on my computer at the time, which was a RiscOS Acorn A3020, which, if I recall correctly, had two megabytes of RAM. It was a very impressive beast indeed. And if I recall correctly, we even put a 100 megabyte hard drive in that thing, so it booted even faster than one might imagine. Once I got the game back to my house in merry old Spennymoor, which was where I lived at the time, I actually fell ill for a couple of days, and it wasn't really that bad, I think it was just a cold, but I'm also fairly sure I faked glandular fever to avoid going back to school so I could play Dungeon Keeper, at which point I smashed my way through the campaign. I played nothing but Dungeon Keeper. After I got the thing to run in the first place, I didn't even run it on a PC, I ran it Basically on a PC emulation hardware card that was inside our RiscOS machine at the time, but I got it to run. The music didn't work, but I got it to run, and I played the whole thing through, and it was a fantastic experience. The original Dungeon Keeper was met with significant acclaim. It was a game that EA released after Bullfrog really got their claws into them, and it's strange to even think that a developer can get the claws into a publisher at the time, but EA back then... A long time ago, took a few more risks. They were actually the reason the Populous got published in the first place. Peter Molyneux and the guys over at Bullfrog had great difficulty finding a publisher for Populous because it was a new genre, nobody wanted to take the risk. However, Electronic Arts at the time was willing to do that. And after the success of Populous, they were able to renegotiate their contracts and they had free reign to do a lot of things, which included classic releases such as Magic Carpet, Syndicate, and of course the Mighty Dungeon Keeper. The original game came out in 1997 using a modified version of the Magic Carpet engine, which was actually designed for the first-person carpet flying simulator that was released in 1994, and it was a mixture of dungeon management with a few god game elements as well as some real-time strategy stuff. Unlike the more traditional real-time strategies at the time, which were things like, of course, Command and Conquer and Red Alert, it was a little more hands-off. You couldn't directly control your creatures outside of a possession spell, which allowed you to go inside the creature and fight from a first-person perspective, which was incredibly unique at the time and, well, still is to this very day. But more often than not, the best you could do is pick up your creatures and drop them near a fight and then hope for the best. It was about getting the right composition of creatures and training them up to the appropriate levels, as well as setting up devious traps and obstacles within your dungeon to weaken the invading heroes before finishing them off with your evil forces. It was quite the heady mixture, and it came along to great acclaim, and rightfully so. It was Peter Molyneux's final project before he left Bullfrog in order to found Lionhead, where he went on several years later to release the game Black and White. It's relatively fair to say, I think, that no game that Peter Molyneux developed after Dungeon Keeper could quite live up to that. Dungeon Keeper was a dark and gloomy master masterpiece with excellent strategy elements and an extremely enjoyable and varied campaign, which was only amplified by the release of the Deeper Dungeons expansion pack in 1997. 
Yes, you didn't mishear me. I did in fact say 1997, November the 30th to be exact. Back then it was acceptable to release an expansion pack for a game a mere few months after the release of the original game. This is the kind of thing that still happens of course with the release of modern day DLC, however the four maps given to you in a Call of Duty map pack don't exactly live up to the 15 excellent levels and AI improvements that came along with the deeper dungeons. And so Bullfrog had a real hit on their hands, a cult classic, and after the development of Theme Hospital and Populous The Beginning, they went on to develop Dungeon Keeper 2, which will be the main subject of today's video, a game that was released two years later in June of 1999. This version received great acclaim for its twisted visuals, converting the sprites of the original to fully realized 3D polygon models. It also added a My Pet Dungeon mode, which was something of a sandbox allowing you to create the ideal dungeon and all manner of different scenarios for yourself without having to worry about the pressure of the campaign missions. There were also numerous changes to the game that Bullfrog felt actually made it better and improved it from the original, however not everybody agreed. The game was criticized by fans and publications alike for not really being enough of an advancement over the original. Regardless, it was still rated relatively highly, although it didn't sell quite as well, and... There's where things started to get a little bit murky for Bullfrog, and where everything started to go wrong. As I mentioned earlier, Peter Molyneux, the head of the company, had left several years before, and Bullfrog was very much operating under the watchful eye of EA, having developed several more games and releasing Dungeon Keeper 2 to only moderate success, their last two games, Theme Park World and Theme Park Inc, didn't do particularly well either. The original Theme Park of course had been a runaway success for Bullfrog and is still widely considered to be an absolute classic, however the more complex Roller Coaster Tycoon series by Chris Sawyer had very much muscled in on that end of the market. Roller Coaster Tycoon came out in the same year as Theme Park World, and was considered by many to be the better, more complex and more in-depth title. It was a series, of course, that continued through several expansion packs and two sequels, and by the time Theme Park Inc. came out, it seemed that people weren't really all that interested anymore. That was the last game to be created under the Bullfrog brand, and the remains of the company were eventually cannibalized into Electronic Arts UK in 2004. But what of Dungeon Keeper? What ended up happening there? Well, there are conflicting stories about Dungeon Keeper 3, a game that was actually teased as Dungeon Keeper 3 War of the Overworld, and even a CGI trailer released least to that effect on the Dungeon Keeper 2 disc. According to Ernest W. Adams, he had been brought over to Electronic Arts to work on the next game in the Populous series before that was eventually cancelled due to its similarities to Black and White, the game that Peter Molyneux was working on at Lionhead, which was also incidentally being published by EA. The team therefore set to work on Dungeon Keeper 3 War for the Overworld, which unfortunately never got past the basic concept design stage. They'd been told by EA due to the relative commercial failure of Dungeon Keeper 2 to make the game more accessible to a wider audience, and it was intended that the game would be a more traditional real-time strategy, which would involve the building of castles on the surface as opposed to dungeons underground. The game would feature three races, the Dungeon Dwellers, the Humans, and the mysterious Elder. Each race would have its own castle theme and you could play as any one of them, a very big departure from the other two games in the series. According to Ernest, the game was going to have a multiplayer focus since the first two games frankly didn't do that all that well. Unfortunately, it was not to be. In March of the year 2000, game sales were in something of a slump waiting for the PlayStation 2 as consumers decided rather than buying games for their old systems, they would hang on and wait for the next big thing. In a time when revenues were down, EA was negotiating with New Line Cinema to gain access to lucrative licenses such as Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. EA, needless to say, chose the film licenses, and what remained of Bullfrog was sent off to work on those games, only not under the Bullfrog license. The total team for Dungeon Keeper 3, as credited, was a mere three people. Lead designer Ernest W. Adams, game designer Nick Ricks, and producer Nick Goldsworthy. And so the franchise died, until rather recently, as a rumbling began beneath the earth, the rumors of a new Dungeon Keeper game being created by EA. Fans of the old series were of course very excited until they learned that this in fact would be a mobile game. Unfortunately, it seems that all of our worst fears were realized with Dungeon Keeper Mobile, which is a soulless husk of a title. 
a free-to-play cow-clicking cash vampire that bears little to no resemblance to the original in any way whatsoever. Indeed, it plays more like a Facebook game than anything else, with certain blocks within the world taking a full 24 hours to mine out unless you're willing to pay gems, which of course can be acquired either via lengthy, weeks-long mining or just a little bit of real cash. This video is to celebrate Dungeon Keeper 2, however, rather than dwell on the abomination that is Dungeon Keeper Mobile. For the last few minutes, no doubt, you've been taking in what's been going on on the screen, so... Let me discuss why I absolutely love the Dungeon Keeper franchise, and why I actually believe that Dungeon Keeper 2 is a phenomenal title indeed. So, as you'll have noticed over the past 10 or so minutes, I've been mining out my ideal dungeon, playing a little bit of skirmish against the paranoid AI who has been hanging out in his dungeon, kind of an ideal for demonstration purposes sort of bot that you can pick up. Some of them are a little more aggressive, let's just say, and... Really, the skirmish mode was not exactly where the strength of the game lay, but once you've beaten the campaign, it's really where you needed to go, because multiplayer, unfortunately, wasn't so much of an option with either of the Dungeon Keeper games. It's not that you couldn't do it, it's that it really wasn't all that well built, and eventually, unofficial patches later and fixes in the GOG version have enabled people to play multiplayer, and it's actually not too shabby, but initially it was woefully incomplete in that respect. And the problem with Dungeon Keeper is it works better when you are up against heroes. Yeah? So you are defending your dungeon and, of course, attacking a hero dungeon, as it were, from various invasions of heroes as they come in and you set traps in order to defend your dungeon from the marauding heroes who are attempting to scourge you from the land. Doing this against a fellow dungeon master is not as fun as that, which leaves you in this really awkward spot with Dungeon Keeper, where if you are, have beaten the campaign, then you are left with sort of a subpar experience after the fact. But the skirmish is an ideal place to demonstrate the full length and breadth of mechanics that are available here, because otherwise the, the campaign has a tendency of dragging out for a while and not giving you access to particularly cool creatures. So you'll probably notice that there's an awful lot of digging involved, and there's an awful lot of slapping of imps, and you know, that's not a euphemism for anything in particular. And these imps will allow you to dig out various areas of the map, and that was actually one of the coolest things about Dungeon Keeper, is that instead of playing on a map like you would in a real-time strategy, you almost made your own map. It's not to say that there weren't limitations, there were, of course, impenetrable rock areas, like the stuff that you see over to the left there. There were areas with lava in it, there were pre-spawned areas with heroes and also potential rewards like spell boxes. But aside from that, you could really go wild with digging out your very own dungeon and it would look different every single time. Of course, there were certain rules that you probably should follow, like not making a room that looked like that, for instance. You know, you generally wanted a square room because it was more efficient. As you saw earlier, I increased the size of my combat pit, which allowed me to fit more creatures in the pit. You know, it wasn't just a case of, oh, bigger rooms are more efficient. It's a case of bigger rooms have more stuff in them, physically more stuff that you can actually see. A bigger combat pit means more people can fit in it. A bigger hatchery has more chicken sheds, which spawn more chickens, and so on and so forth. A bigger prison could quite literally just fit more inmates in it. And it was a nice visual way of showing exactly what was going on there. There were certain exceptions. Sometimes you wouldn't want or indeed couldn't have a perfectly sized room. And in certain circumstances, if you wanted to summon a secret elite creatures, you had to build specific room configurations, like the library that I built over there, which I believe was a 5x5, five five, but it had a lair in each corner, which allowed me to summon an elite warlock, which researches things ludicrously fast, which is why I have all the spells only 10 minutes into the game, although not upgraded. Mainly because I kind of forgot that you could do that, but never mind, I remember later on. And the wonderful thing about the dungeon design was an emphasis on long corridors that could be filled with nasty evil traps and gubbins. All sorts of things like that. A variety of different doors. So, of course, the simple wooden door that can resist only a couple of swings, all the way up to a magic door which fires fireballs at anyone attempting to bring it down. Or a secret door that actually looks like a wall and is a little bit more difficult to even discover, let alone actually destroy. It was rather cool, and combining these traps together with things like triggers, which allowed you to trigger chains of traps to obliterate your enemies, was incredibly satisfying. 
But unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, it's usually more satisfying when you're going up against someone that is invading from different angles. The AI is not really known for doing that. So as a result, the traps aren't really as satisfying to pull off. Regardless, though, if you are a fan of management games, then Dungeon Keeper kind of has you covered. You've got to make sure that all of your creatures are happy, and they're happy for different reasons. Warlocks have a tendency of getting unhappy if they don't have any work to do, or any research to do. Bile demons are extra hungry, and will get extremely unhappy very quickly if they're not fed a constant supply of chickens, and so on and so forth. Even the acquisition of those creatures involve certain managerial aspects. You need to have rooms that were large enough, you need to have certain rooms, and in the case of more advanced creatures, you required things like, say, a graveyard filled with corpses in order to raise a vampire, or large temple sacrifices in order to bring on the dark angels, or things like that. Now, in the first game, the Horned Reaper, the ultimate creature, was only something that you could summon if you combined a sacrifice in the temple of various different creatures. I believe a dark mistress, a bile demon, and something else that I can't quite remember. In Dungeon Keeper 2, they decided to make the Horned Reaper a spell, and that was actually a complaint that many fans of the original brought up, saying, you know what, making the Horned Reaper a spell kind of ruined it. Because in the original, summoning a Horned Reaper was a bit of a risk-reward, because, yes, it was a destructive creature, but it was extremely difficult to control, and it was more likely to rampage through your own dungeon than it was through the enemy dungeon. In this case, they made a spell, which will summon for as long as your mana reserves stay in shape, and that's pretty much it. And it's kind of cool to see Horny rampage through the dungeon, but it's not as awesome as it once was. Other complaints about Dungeon Keeper 2, which were fairly valid, involved a lack of creativity with the monster list this time around. In the original Dungeon Keeper, you had very few humanoid monsters, and the game included such interesting things as spiders, beetles, ghosts, and in fact tentacles that could only be summoned to your dungeon if there happened to be a lot of water on the map. Unfortunately, this time around, they decided to go with a few more humanoid enemies, which included the Black Knight, Dark Elf, and Rogue, and some people didn't really like that, and I don't necessarily blame them for it. It's unfortunate that Dungeon Keeper 2 did veer a little bit away from the House of Horrors feel that Dungeon Keeper 1 had. You had very few humanoid minions, and you had an awful lot of nasty beasties, such as Hellhounds and Demon Spawn and all sorts of things like that. It's a shame they moved away from that, and one has to wonder why. It could have been something to do with the fact that they decided to go for fully 3D models this time around, as opposed to sprites, and perhaps the animation requirements of those various creatures in full 3D at the time, which was not exactly all that common for real-time strategy, was a little bit too much for them. That's just speculation, though. One way or the other, it's something that some of the veteran fans of the series certainly did not approve of. What I personally do approve of... The difference between Dungeon Keeper 1 and 2 is the fact that spells are now on a separate bar rather than using gold. You have a mana bar for your spells, which means that you are encouraged to use them more liberally, which does make things a little bit more enjoyable, as far as I'm concerned. It also solves, in many ways, the problem of running out of money on maps that don't have infinite gem veins, and allows you to summon gold for a hefty cost of mana. Some people, again, though, complained about that and said that the balance between building rooms and paying your minions, as well as using spells, was an interesting element of strategy. And it's hard to really disagree with that logic, other than to say that I perhaps prefer the ability to more liberally use my spells. The game also featured a bunch of minor improvements and balances from the original, including the idea that you can store gold at your dungeon heart, at least a limited amount of it, which prevented problems like not being able to build a treasury because you can't store gold, but the treasury costs gold, which you can't store, so you can't buy it, and you can certainly see the problem with that. And also the fact that when you drop creatures onto the map, they are now stunned momentarily to prevent you from just picking up all your creatures and dumping them on top of a fight. And it almost manages to do that. For all of its strengths, one of Dungeon Keeper's failings, in my opinion, is big, large-scale combat. Because, frankly, it is more of a god game than an RTS, meaning that you do not have direct control of your minions. You can possess a minion, which is a rather fantastic little innovation, which allows you to actually see from a first-person perspective, going into the eyes of one of your minions and being able to use his combat abilities. This also meant that the minion was a lot stronger. 
It was certainly a neat little trick, but aside from that, it was more of a case of creating an attack formation with your stronger creatures at the front and your weaker ranged creatures towards the rear, and just letting them go at it. More often than not, creatures would actually wander off, almost bored of the encounter, and you'd have to use a spell like Call to Arms in order to force your creatures to come to where they needed to be. It indicated something of a populous influence to the series, very much so. In a similar way to the first couple of Populous games, combat was initiated only when an enemy met an enemy, and actually directly controlling your troops was done by summoning a totem or idol to force your followers to walk to a particular location on the map. This is, of course, in stark contrast to games like Command & Conquer, where you would build troops and then deliberately order them around. They wouldn't really do much without your own personal touch. But... The strange thing about that is, while it does sound negative, it's also kind of a key point of this genre mashing title. It's not a real-time strategy, and frankly, the micromanagement of creatures to that degree would more often than not, I think, get a little bit frustrating. Indeed, veteran fans of the series objected to the addition of the combat pit in Dungeon Keeper 2, which involved a little bit more micromanagement. You would have to take creatures that you wanted to pass level 4 and throw them into the combat pit to actually fight and gain levels past that. In the previous version of the game, you could train all the way up to max level, which was level 10, simply using the training room. Some viewed that as needless micromanagement in what was actually... A god game and management sim, which means that you are a little bit more hands-off. And that's the strange thing about it, because it's a mixture of all of those things. Yes, it is a management sim, but it's also a god game, and it also has those real-time strategy and economy management elements to it. So, the question is, did it get the balance right? Well, for the most part, it actually did. Managing a large dungeon meant that the last thing you really wanted to be doing was micromanaging individual minions. Minions could take care of themselves as long as you set up your dungeon correctly and as long as they weren't being stabbed to death by the heroes that were invading your dungeon at regular intervals. If you build the facilities that the minions need, they're smart enough to use them themselves. And if you need more direct control, you can either possess or pick up a bunch of minions and toss them in the direction of something that you want to be dealt with. Indeed, the imps are actually incredibly smart. Compare them to a game like Rimmed Capsule, whereby the minions do rather silly things and take suboptimal paths to their objectives. The imps more often than not prioritize their tasks very well. If you dropped an imp near or on top of a knocked out creature that was about to die, it would grab the creature and drag it back to its lair to recover, and it would do so very reliably. Imps would automatically run away if attacked, meaning that you didn't have to babysit them all the time. And more often than not, they would actually perform their tasks at the right kind of speed so that you wouldn't end up getting frustrated. If you compare it to other games where minions have to do your bidding in some ways, such as, say, Tropico, the imps are incredibly hard workers, and you can encourage them to work a little bit harder with a slap, which you could do directly. Just a, a little kind of micro-element that they put into the game to give you that optional level of engagement if you so desire to use it, which would speed things up a little bit. So you were never at any point sitting around wondering what to do. You could always build more stuff, you could always meddle somewhere, get into a fight, dig out a new tunnel and there really wasn't an awful lot of downtime in Dungeon Keeper and that's quite impressive because management games more often than not have you waiting for something. Not really the case with Dungeon Keeper honestly. You don't really have to wait. Rooms are constructed pretty much instantly. Traps do take some time to build, but you can increase the building time by making a more efficient workshop and attracting more creatures such as trolls and bile demons that are good at building things within that workshop. If you want to accelerate the rate at which someone is doing something, stick one of their friends in a torture chamber and that will give you a 25% boost in speed to whatever activities happen to be going on. Oh, of course, you can just give them a copious slap. Not something you really want to overdo because they get very upset and then they will eventually leave your dungeon. Even the imps in Dungeon Keeper 2 will actually level up as they do particular tasks, which is an extremely useful feature that wasn't really present in Dungeon Keeper 1, where every creature had to be trained. In this case, you can have creatures like imps actually level up by mining and reinforcing rooms, which means that you don't have to try and train imps and do all sorts of nonsense like that. Imps will also learn some spells as they level up, allowing them to perform their tasks more efficiently. 
Particularly in the campaign, it was obvious that the pacing was just absolutely spot on. In the campaign, you're always waiting for the next wave of heroes to come in and you're frantically building up in order to repulse the next wave of attacks and also trying to dig out to find the base of your opponent in order to destroy them before they get too powerful. You always felt like you were on the clock and as such you always had something to do. The level of income that you had coming in was just about right. You could store a lot of gold in order to build a lot of stuff at once. Overall, the economic management, even though you're really only managing a single major resource, was absolutely fantastic. It's also important to note just how strong both the visuals and the humor were in Dungeon Keeper 2. While some people may say the humor was stronger in the original, there's still plenty of great one-liners from the absolutely fantastic narrator, as well as some really twisted visuals. I mean, surprisingly enough, the visuals of this game stand up fairly well, and you don't generally expect one of the earlier 3D titles to do that. The reason it manages to do it is because it sticks to this very interesting art style where things are warped and deformed, and as as a direct result, funnily enough, it actually looks pretty good. The lighting effects in play are certainly basic, but they're effective and they really help to accentuate the dark and dingy atmosphere that's going on and everything feels just a little bit wrong. And that's a wonderful little piece of art direction as far as I'm concerned. It looks very unique. You don't find games that look like this. At the time, this game was absolutely gorgeous. One of the best looking strategy games around. I mean, consider... The Command & Conquer title at the time was Tiberian Sun, released in the same year, and then compare the visuals of that to something like this, and this is pretty impressive for the time. Of course, the original game was confined to 4x3 resolution, but a little registry hack allowed me to play it in 1920x1080 with a couple of minor UI problems, such as all the tooltips on the options menu breaking and the actual cell tab down to the bottom left there next to the minimap being slightly out of alignment, meaning that you had to click to the right of it in order to actually do it. Aside from that, the UI works perfectly and it does the job. You know, it's got the nice tabbed setup there allowing you to switch between spells and minions and buildings at will as well as grab a large number of minions from your minion list very very quickly indeed the fact of the matter is that unfortunately games like this are not the sort of things that we really see anymore and i do believe that there is still a very large market for this kind of thing the creation of devious traps the idea of creating your own dungeon in real time it is an attractive notion, and games like Mighty Quest for Epic Loot very much play on that and really would not exist if Dungeon Keeper hadn't been as strong a title as it was. Even with the stripped-down mechanics of something like Mighty Quest and a lack of overall economic management and economy elements that are really more akin to a Facebook game than a full-priced PC release, you are still looking at a game that does have a fun element of dungeon design as well as a variety of devious traps and minions that you can summon and improve. In fact, Dungeon Keeper spawned a variety of games, some of them very good, including 2001 Startopia, an absolutely fantastic title that again very much stands the test of time, asking you to create and manage a space station. Evil Genius, which came out in 2004, which certainly took many, many elements indeed from Dungeon Keeper, translating it into the notion of you running a secret island base against a variety of super agents from around the world. Unfortunately, recent efforts such as Empire and Dungeons were by no means even close. Dungeons with some head-scratching design decisions and mechanics and Empire frankly just being a very poor title indeed that didn't really capture the feel of Dungeon Keeper in any way, shape, or form. And now, well, folks, now we have this. As you can see on the screen in its glorious 4x3, what a wonderful throwback in terms of resolution, isn't it? Dungeon Keeper Mobile, a recent free-to-play release by EA Mythic, which is nothing but a gigantic disappointment, something that takes an unholy dump upon the corpse of a venerated franchise. EA seems to have taken the series' tagline, evil is good, a little bit too literally, and perhaps they should be going for greed is good instead, because this game barely even resembles the Dungeon Keepers of old. All of the complexity gone, all of the real-time dungeon management gone, 
all of the hero raids and wonderful trap setups that you could actually put together in real time to defend your dungeon against wave after wave after wave of thieving, spineless, smelly heroes. That, unfortunately, has all disappeared. What were we left with? A glorified Facebook game, which is, embarrassingly enough, actually not as good as the Facebook game Dungeon Overlord, released in 2011, which certainly wore its Dungeon Keeper influences on its sleeve, although made no claims to actually be Dungeon Keeper. Surprisingly, that game played fairly well for a Facebook title, but this, a game bearing the name of the franchise and, of course, IP owned by EA themselves, is an absolute disgrace. This is a game where you do nothing. You remember what I was talking about earlier when I was saying Dungeon Keeper always had you doing something, the pacing was just absolutely perfect, the game was responsive and it always felt like you were making progress. Well, this is a game that's the very antithesis of that. We're talking about uh, gem blocks taking a full 24 hours to mine out and being necessary to mine out in order to access more of these sort of resource nodes. The mining of gold is not something that happens anymore. You don't mine out a gold area, you take control of a mine and then you are given gold every few minutes, which you then pick up farm style by tapping on the gold resource. It's a game that doesn't let you do anything for more than about a minute and then requires you to babysit the damn thing every hour. It's, ironically enough, a warped defamation of the original where your minions were very sensible and could really get along with their own affairs, something where you felt like you were influencing the direction of the dungeon and being the grand designer rather than the caretaker, rather than the janitor of this wretched, fetid hole that we now find ourselves in with Dungeon Keeper Mobile. They've even separated out the notion of dungeon invasions into a separate mode entirely where all you do is spawn minions and watch them do whatever the hell they want to do. It's absolutely ridiculous. Your actual dungeon is attacked kind of in a separate section in PvP and to attack the dungeons in a campaign mode you are teleported to another map entirely. There's no design here. There's no ability to dig out your custom-sized rooms and place a series of devious traps. It is all dumbed down to the absolute bare minimum and loaded. I mean, absolutely loaded with microtransactions. Every resource can be bought. There's a plus next to absolutely everything. Even imps cost so many in-game gems that you're better off actually buying them for real money. And do enjoy the notion of spending $5 on a virtual creature that might dig your stuff out a little bit quicker. What a disgrace this title is. What an absolute disgrace. The Horned Reaper is rolling in his grave. They didn't even get the original voice actor. So it's nothing but a pale imitation, which I think is rather suitable for this abomination of a title. Avoid at all costs, ladies and gentlemen. If you do wish to play Dungeon Keeper, both Dungeon Keeper Gold and Dungeon Keeper 2 are available on GOG. And where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Is this yet again why we can't have nice things? Is this once great franchise simply bound to disappear into the mists of time and never grace our monitors again? Well... Welcome back, Underworld. To the war for the overworld. Thank you, Turtle Biscuit. For a cynical Brit, you certainly are generous. Can we interest you in the Master Suite? Our last guest seems to have checked out early. We will call off the gargoyles for now. <laughs> Here we have War for the Overworld, the successfully kickstarted Unity game based, of course, on Dungeon Keeper, being created by Subterranean Games, hopefully scheduled for release this year. 
This is the uh, beta version that is currently available on Steam, and my oh my has it come a long way since I first looked at it, and it is looking good. Not only is it looking good, but it's feeling good as well. The actual dungeon management aspects, the digging out of rock, the design of rooms, and even the aesthetic, they all seem to have been nailed, but without completely cloning the original. Uh, and I think it's good that it's got its own little sense of style, but is immediately recognizable and familiar to those of us who enjoy Dungeon Keeper. Make no mistake, Dungeon Keeper Mobile is Dungeon Keeper in name alone. The true successor to that game is very clearly this, War for the Overworld, which is quite obviously being crafted with love and respect for the original franchise, even if they don't have the rights to the original name. Blessed by Peter Molyneux himself, ladies and gentlemen. If that's not enough endorsement for you, then I certainly do not know what is. So, while Dungeon Keeper Mobile and the demise of the franchise might be why we can't have nice things, the creativity and talent of those at Subterranean Games, as well as the monetary support of the Kickstarters, may very well eventually lead us to something very nice indeed. My name has been Total Biscuit. I'll see you next time.